Hi everyone, welcome to the CESG uh, Fishbowl Tele Seminar. Our uh, speaker today is Professor Deepankar Rai Chaudhary from WinLab and Rutgers University. Professor uh, Rai Chaudhary got his uh, Master's and PhD from Sunny, Sunny Stony Brook and uh, since then he has been in several positions both in industry and in academia. So for example, he's uh, been uh, uh, at IOSPAN Wireless as Chief Scientist. He's been at uh, department head at uh, NEC Lab and Broadband Communications and Sarnoff Corporation, as well as at Rutgers University at Bin Lab, where they have a very large wireless desktop. And he's going to talk to us today about cellular internet conversion. Please welcome Professor Rai Chow. Okay, <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, so again, thank you for stepping up the talk and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, so what I plan today is to give you a, uh, some sense of what we're doing with one of our large projects at WinLab, which is called the Mobility First Future Internet Architecture. And I'm going to give a, a particular a snapshot of this, which is taking a look at what it does to the wireless and mobile networking uh, that has become so important today. So let me uh, start with my first uh, my first slide here, just give me a second. Okay. Uh, did you see the uh, slide that says introduction there? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, just a brief introduction, of course, is that we all know how mobility has become a key driver for the future internet. And I don't think I need to belabor to this group the fact that there's been a very historic shift away from PCs to mobile computing and embedded devices. There, there is a famous report from Cisco called the Cisco BNI report, which predicts that smartphone traffic will grow by uh, huge amounts. And the chart at the bottom sort of shows you if you are interested, you could dig into this and see that smartphone growth uh, is, of course, on an exponential curve. But there are also some other types of devices which are predicted to grow quite rapidly. These include uh, embedded sensor type devices, machine to machine applications, and cars and vehicular network type of traffic all of which are expected to increase at an exponential rate starting in about 2015. So uh, with all this happening, the net effect on the internet is that by 2016, wired traffic constitutes less than 40% of the total traffic. And uh, in a short time, it will actually be only a small minority. So given that requirement, we really need to reconsider internet architecture, at least from a research point of view. Uh, clearly, any ideas we have for internet architecture are not going to go in overnight, but it is worth considering in a more fundamental way, what does this do to the internet? Are we equipped to deal with this deluge of mobile data coming from devices which are not tethered anymore, which come in from a wireless medium? So let's discuss a little more about what that means. Of course, today there is already a solution that we are all using, which is the cellular network, which has a gateway into the internet. So those familiar with how the architecture looks like today, uh, the slide that I have here at the bottom left, you can see today's current architecture, which uh, works reasonably well at some level, where a mobile device like a smartphone uh, is accessed over what is called a radio access network or RAN. And this RAN has a control plane that interfaces with something called an MME, which is uh, one of the elements in the 3GPP architecture, which is used by the cellular industry. And there's a service gateway or SGW, which then uh, interfaces to the global internet. So this is an architecture which, of course, relies on a customized local area network technology with its own addressing scheme, its own uh, signaling. It has a completely distinct uh, security procedures from the internet, but it can be glued together using a gateway. So the gateway approach is something that 
everyone realizes is not desirable from many points of view. Gateway represents the single point of failure. It's the bottleneck technology. Uh, a lot of the traffic limitations that you see in terms of performance. So, for example, the typical gateway latency is of the order of 100 milliseconds or more. So many applications suffer because of this. So the industry does recognize that we need to evolve from this to something else. And this is still a debatable question of what exact requirements we need to be able to address. And in doing so, what's the architecturally right approach to take? So if you look to the arrow pointing to the right-hand side, we have outlined a general vision over here of an edge network uh, which has mobility services built into it. And in this architecture, the idea is that the future internet itself evolves to be able to plug different kinds of radio access networks into the architecture without requiring any specialized equipment such as gateways or MME. So in this vision, the idea is that a radio is a plug-in device much like today's Ethernet type of device, which plugs quite simply into the Internet. And the Internet protocol takes care of everything except the lower link layer type of uh, functionality that a radio access network might have. So in this picture, you can see we have perhaps three different kinds of radio technologies which are represented uh, over here as RAN A, RAN B, and RAN C. All of these just simply plug in by connecting a base station directly to an internet router. And note that this is not something that you can do today. Today, except for Wi-Fi, which was designed to be connected to the ethernet, you cannot just take a wireless device, a wireless base station and plug it in. And there are many reasons why you can't do that. So the idea is to have a future IP control plane which has built-in mobility support plus any other feature that we think is important going forward. So going to the next slide, I'm going to here break down some of the requirements that we uh, that this environment imposes. So one of the, of course, the most basic requirement is that of supporting device migration as a basic service. So here what we're saying is that instead of having a specialized local area network, which is today's cellular network in this case, uh, or 80211 also has some uh, handoff and roaming capability, but without requiring any of these, the internet should provide mobility as a basic service. This was already in the vision of uh, IPv6, and mobile IPv6 is widely implemented, although not yet widely used. But one of the reasons why it was never implemented is that the underlying architectural decision to use address-based Mobility is something that uh, leads to many problems, and uh, that's one of the reasons why it never caught on. So, but as far as, uh, without going into how we achieve this, the basic idea is that as the user moves from uh, one wireless access network to another with uh, different ownerships, different autonomous systems, you should have seamless mobility in terms of what cellular people call handoff and roaming. Handoff refers to the smooth transfer of data from one network to another. Roaming refers to uh, seamless association and being able to continuously migrate to different kinds of networks. This is not something that we can do today. If you look at what happens today, uh, each Wi-Fi network that you go to, you have to have some either some prior authentication or you have to log in separately. Or uh, and you have to disconnect your TCP sessions and be able to restart again when you get into a new network. So this is a limitation that we are accustomed to today that need not be there. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, here I show an additional kind of requirement, which is also related to the idea of how the Internet architecture was built earlier, which was based on the notion of end-to-end -end TCP. Of course, end-to-end -end TCP requires that there's a continuous path from end-to-end, -end, and the protocol assumes that this, the, any discontinuity is very short-lived because there are timing issues, and uh, a protocol will fail, and uh, the application will discontinue if you have any kind of disconnection today. So 
Making the internet more robust to disconnection has been a topic of research. Many people in the wireless field have also worked on things like delay tolerant delivery. Uh, and it is possible to come up with new ideas by which one can introduce a level of delay tolerance into the internet. And uh, this has implications again, I'm not uh, proposing any specific design here, but we need to reconsider the end to end TCP model, perhaps a hop by hop model, which was considered maybe 25, 30 years ago for other internet architectures which uh, didn't succeed. IP eventually took over. Some of them had hop by hop reliability and didn't rely on an end to end transport. So, again, for the wired internet, it made a lot of sense. For wireless internet, we need to reconsider that, especially what, has, as you can see, that there are two effects over here. One is that you have a fast changing bitrate, which leads to distortions in the transport layer protocol, and full disconnection can occur for periods of seconds or minutes as the case may be. Okay, moving to the next slide, uh, I'm outlining yet another requirement that we think is important for uh, future mobile networks, and that is multicast as a basic service. So today, of course, you know, in the internet community, there have been a variety of multicast protocols, PIM, SIM, and so on, but all of them are essentially overlay protocols where you have to first execute a session level protocol to set up the path, and then the multicast traffic flows along those paths. So instead, what we feel is very important in a mobile wireless environment, there are many situations which are inherently multicast, where it is desirable to read uh, for a single packet to be addressable to a multicast group. An example of this is if you want to, for example, uh, send a packet to taxis in a certain region of uh, the city, say taxis in Dallas downtown, uh, that packet, uh, it's just a single packet, it's not possible to set up a session level multicast protocol in advance to all these people. And there's a wireless channel which itself is a broadcast medium that might, with just one transmission, reach uh, hundreds of de desired users. So we need to exploit the broadcast medium. At the same time, we need to have a mechanism by which the multicasting can be done on a packet by packet basis rather than on a session by session basis. So this again we feel is a very important requirement of fine-grain packet level multicasting, which will enable a lot of new applications, whether it's cars talking to each other on the highway or people trying to uh, address a group by context or location or function. Okay, so that was one requirement. Another interesting requirement that we see for mobile networks uh, of the future, which again has become very relevant today, is the notion of multi-homing. So multi-homing today is something that can be achieved using specialized protocols like MPTCP. Uh, it's interesting that the Apple's iOS 7 now does have support for MPTCP uh, knowing that there might be a combination of Wi-Fi and cellular on a typical mobile platform. So with any mobile platform, one of the fundamental differences from a wired network is that it can see at any time 10 to 20 networks. If you're in downtown Manhattan, you can probably see 50 networks at the same time. So this is really, uh, when you think about it, it's not a minor change. With the Ethernet, you always had this one port that you took a wire and you plugged it into your PC, and that didn't change for months in most cases. Here, instead, you have 30 to 50 networks which are visible from the mobile device. And there's no reason why we should adopt the old policy of finding your network and sticking to that one network. We need to be able to take advantage of this multiplicity to overcome some of the impairments and other difficulties that we have with networks. So while wireless networks are inherently limited in their physics, they have the advantage of being accessible to everyone who is in that region. So uh, this is again something multi-home means that I can simultaneously connect to two networks. A common example that people are familiar with is Wi-Fi and LTE. So if I'm connecting to uh, both 4G and Wi-Fi at the same time, I should be able to do better than connecting separately to these two. 
And ideally, I can make the transition from one to the other kind of seamless, or I can Skype packets across these devices. And it's not limited to two. It might be that you're in the long run, hardware cost is quite low. Uh, you might be able to communicate simultaneously over five networks. So this is one basic shift. And that, of course, means that the network protocol needs to be designed in a different way where you separate ident identity of the device from the network addresses to which it is connected. Today, IP conflates those two items where the identity is derived from the network location itself, whereas uh, if you want to do multi homing properly, you need to separate those two and uh, be able to create a routing architecture that uh, works on both with awareness of both locators as well as identity. So uh, we'll come to this later, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. <laughs> so if I go to the next slide, I uh, just make a further point of this, that multi-homing is often associated with this notion of Wi-Fi hotspot. We're not using both networks, but multi-network access or multi-path is something where multiple access networks are being simultaneously used to support good quality communication to the mobile device. So again, internet needs to support this. It's not something that IP can easily do. Okay, so moving to a little bit more abstract requirement, uh, in addition to these channel-related requirements, we also have some uh, requirements related to what we call information-centric networking. And one uh, important observation of ICN architectures or information-centric concepts is that content is king. And being able to address and retrieve content in a very natural way is a goal of any network, and particularly in mobile networks where the user might be moving and the content is potentially moving around from one device to another or one cache to another, you can have uh, complications that arise with current IP architecture. So the idea here is that you have a, the name of a movie and be able to simply say, get that content identifier. So a service primitive such as get content something that people have considered quite attractive, and we, in our design, too, felt that this would be something quite important and achievable. So uh, this requirement, of course, is currently being served in overlay architectures which involve techniques like CDN. Okay, so uh, another requirement that we consider to be valuable is the notion of context awareness. And uh, mobile services are often associated with context. For example, you want to address taxis in New Brunswick, uh, or you want to have any kind of service which looks for a particular resource in a given region. So those kind of services, this example shows that I, I send a context equal to some geo coordinate plus group membership. So first responders in Rutgers University may be addressed with the packet that has a context identifier, and then some of the network figures out how to route to exactly that group of people. And in this example, you can see, again, that this involves a multicasting paradigm where the packets get uh, copied and replicated and sent in a most efficient way so that the context-aware distribution can also be efficient through the use of uh, multicasting techniques. Okay, so this is a set of, and then finally, I have one more requirement here before we go into the design, which is that of ad hoc and network mobility. So in uh, the internet environment today, we don't have much of this. I think the closest we have come to this uh, model is where Boeing has a uh, modification to BGP that allows an aircraft to Resynchronized with the routing protocol, the entire network moves from one location to another when it reaches an airport. Uh, that's not very fast mobility, but whereas with this kind of uh, automotive environment, you have a group of cars which may have no connection to the internet, which then come into view of an access point and then move to another access point a few minutes later. So that kind of ad hoc association followed by uh, connectivity to the wired internet 
is something that we need to be able to support. And there have been a lot of studies in the past on network mobility and certainly ad hoc networking attracted a lot of research attention for quite some time. So we know how to do ad hoc networking in isolation. I think the challenge is how to integrate ad hoc networking models into the mainstream internet architecture without messing up the performance in the wired domain. Uh, and just to conclude here, I give one more requirement, which is more on the uh, control plane or management plane requirement. Uh, people have been working for years on spectrum coordination. There is today a standard uh, that has come coming out of the IETF, uh, which talks about having a spectrum server centrally located and being able to predict what spectrum is being used in what location. So when you have any kind of dense spectrum usage scenario, given that most devices are going to be wireless, the network has the best visibility of making the efficient coordination between different radio devices. So our view is that in addition to some of the mainstream service requirements, we can also consider some control plane enhancement to allow for wireless specific services such as coordinating spectrum across networks. Okay, so let me now shift gears to the design of Mobility First, which is a protocol that has been um, in the making for the last three years or so. It came out of this uh, large NSF project, which is under the program called Future Internet Architecture. We have about 15 uh, investigators and eight institutions involved with Rutgers as the lead. So we came up with, we thought about all these requirements, which I uh, outlined to you. We also have to meet all the existing requirements of the internet in terms of scale, speed, uh, and so on. And uh, then looked at how we can add this mobility-related requirements that we discussed. So after going through all that, we came up with a set of design ideas, and in this picture, I'm uh, showing you a summary of some of the main features of the mobility first internet architecture. So the basic idea is to move from address based networking, which IP is an example of, to one which is based on named objects or named uh, devices, content and context, which is shown on the top left hand side of this picture. So regardless of what kind of object you have, a person, a group, a car, a movie, it can get its identifier. And we call that kind of identifier a, a GUID or a globally unique identifier. And these identifiers are based on public keys. And they have no semantic significance. They're uh, random bits which are correspond to a properly generated public key. And there's a private key that each person will also maintain. So it gives you some good properties that every object can be named. And it has some security property that the object owner can authenticate that address on demand. Uh, as you look into the network itself, we see that uh, inside this uh, blue cloud, we have a few different capabilities. Every router has got storage built into it. And the idea of storage is based on the fact that wireless is a highly fluctuating and sometimes disconnected kind of medium. So we wanted to add storage to smooth things out and to be able to deliver delay-tolerant delivery at different points. And we found over the years we have done a, a prior project which showed the benefit of storage in network. It also helps in wired, surprisingly it helps and improves the performance in wired networks as well. Uh, the, the architecture also uses the concept of uh, hop by hop transport rather than end to end transport. Uh, and it's something that uh, gives us good properties, including robustness and uh, better end to end throughput than you can get with TCP. Then I show at the bottom that we also support things like network mobility and disconnected mode. And later I'll explain how some of these. Uh, some of these requirements are met. So let's go a little further into the protocol and the solution. So the present, uh, the solution that we've come up with is based on uh, sort of adding a upper layer on the ne of network services, which I've labeled here as meta-level network services. 
So if you start with core transport services, which I see is an example of a core transport service, which is a connectionless packet switching network, we you can think of our architecture as starting with something like IP, but then augmenting it to do GUID based routing, which is object based routing, which I'll describe next, and uh, add to that some storage awareness and delay tolerance in the edge network and do hop by hop transport. So that sort of forms the core transport capability. And on top of that, we have the so called meta level network service, which consists of a global name resolution service, which I'll describe next, uh, and then use that to construct things like name-based services which uh, form the heart of this protocol. And we also have an option for a compute layer plugin, which uh, <coughs> I have time I discussed briefly. And all this has on top of it uh, name certification services which have separate domains of trust and they don't need to be coordinated as I can to be today. So that's a long discussion, but uh, I'll try to get back to that again. Okay, so uh, the protocol stack that first, I'll, I'll give some examples of so this. These will not be as abstract after that. So at the basic protocol stack that we have come up with, uh, it looks somewhat like a internet stack. Uh, and actually, you can fit IP into it. So what we're doing is we have uh, on the blue boxes are our IP routing equivalent box. Uh, function and we call that G star which stands for general storage aware routing and MF interdomain is the new interdomain protocol that we are using and you could put IP in there and use IP as an alternate if you want by giving up some of the functionality and below that just like in the internet we have a variety of the player protocols supported and above you can have different transport layer protocols one difference is that the transport layer protocol does not uh, need to have the same features as TCP because we have reliable hop by hop block transfer uh, in the basic architecture. If you look to the control plane, uh, it's again not very different from IP in the sense that we start with the IP like routing control protocol like BGP and OSPF, modify that, come up with the, uh, the new features that we needed. But on top of it, we put something called the Global Name Resolution Service, or the GNRS, which serves to anchor the GUID-based service layer, which is the narrow waste of the protocol stack. And I'll explain what these are one by one. And then going up, you have something called a Name Certification and Assignment Service, which talks to applications and gives identifiers to different application objects and makes it possible to have trusted identifiers or self-certifying identifiers, a variety of different modes. And those name certification services are important because they can capture some of the content and context semantics, which we don't allow, we don't push those into the network. So in contrast, there is a protocol architecture that you may have heard about called the CCN or content-centric networking or uh, NDN, name data networking. Uh, which is led by Lishia Zhang uh, from UCLA. So they have taken a different approach where the content is pushed down all the way to the network layer and content semantics are carried through the routers in the network layer, which is a difference from what we have done is we, we just have an abstract flat identifier, which is called a GUID, and all the semantics of content or context are kept above this layer uh, and are assigned through the NCS or name certification service. Okay, so let me try to explain some of the key components now. The first piece that is important to look at is this name and address separation and how it works in this architecture. So uh, as I mentioned before, we have a variety of naming services, which are these vertical uh, yellow stacks which are at the top of this picture. So if I by a sensor, there's some naming service in the internet which I go to, which will assign it a name and then come up with a GUID value that is then used to network that device. Similarly, a taxi in New Brunswick or a media file can go to its own content or context naming service 
a host will have its own naming service and uh, so on. So different industries can group to form naming services. Uh, an individual can create his, his or her own naming service as well and produce self-certified uh, globally unique identifiers. So there's a whole range of options over there. So once you have a globally unique identifier, you go down to what we call the, the ENRS, which is an important part of this architecture, the Global Name Resolution Service, which maps the identifiers to network addresses. So a GUID gets mapped to a set of NAs corresponding to the current points of attachment of the object to the network. So uh, once you have that, you can do more conventional kind of topology-based routing through the network. Uh, routing is supported at the GUID level, which is an abstract object-based routing, which then gets mapped down to topology, and then we can use more conventional type routing algorithms to better find a path through the network and then go back up to the object identifier level. So let's take, yes. How do you, I mean, there would be a very large number of these GUIDs, right? How do you yes. map them to the, uh, how do you uh, essentially design the resolution service? Okay, so that's the next slide actually. So uh, actually I have a couple of more slides, I'll come to that. We have something called a global name resolution service, which has to be implemented in a scalable way across the network. And as you point out, there could be a hundred billion object identifiers, so every router cannot keep a table of 100 billion objects. So we use, uh, we leverage peer-to-peer -peer technology to be able to spread out that function across the network. So I'll show you how we actually do it. Okay, so before I get to the DNRS implementation, just a couple of uh, more uh, concepts about the service abstractions that Mobility First offers. So if you compare a mobility first abstraction with the IP abstraction. So IP has this concept of a virtual link where you send uh, to a particular address port. And so you're basically connecting port A to port B across this network and there's a static binding of the MAC address to that port X. In the mobility first abstraction, what we're doing is we're sending the GUID value to a given GUID value, a set of data and options, and the options can specify things like multi-homing, late binding, and so on. Uh, and in that, you can have, again, uh, the GUID, if it is multiply connected to a bunch of different network addresses, X1, X2, X3, this abstraction allows you to reach all of them, and you can have additional features like delayed delivery and timeouts and so on. In while specifying this. So another set, another type of abstraction uh, that you can have is, for example, if uh, A is a replicated piece of content, then the GUID, by specifying get content GUID equal to A, whoever has that content and happens to be close by can send that back to you. So this is a reverse anycast type of operation where uh, I am able to ask for a GUID and then uh, whoever is close enough and has that content can serve that up. So uh, this is basically a reverse NCAS function uh, at the GUID level. Then you can also have an abstraction to send to a group object with multicast reachability. So in this example, if there's a broadcast medium, you can go across that broadcast medium and simultaneously with multiple GUIDs uh, by having a compound GUID, which is a group multicast address. So this is actually, we have a paper in Mobi Arc which just appeared, and if anybody is interested, this sort of gives the top level view of how the service APIs are constructed for this matter. So let me uh, explain how the network works uh, using the example of mobility service and uh, using name resolution. So in this example, you see that the packet that we send out uh, is going to have a GUID. The, there's a little green uh, subfield, which is called the SID or the service identifier. And there are multiple optional identifier and optional network addresses, which are these blue 
slices which you see in the packet below. So the basic authoritative routing header is the GUID. The SIG gives the intent of the service, so it defines things like service type, and the routers can take certain actions based on the service identifier, and the network addresses are not required to be a part of the packet, but if they can be resolved and inserted into the packet, they could save routers some time by creating a fast path uh, lookup, which is right there in the data, and they don't need to consult the GNRS. So the GNRS, as shown there, is a, the yellow cloud below the mobility first data plane. It's a control function in which if I send a GUID request to it, it comes back with the current set of network addresses. So in this particular example, uh, we can register a GUID corresponding to John Smith 22's devices. And he happens to have two devices, which is a mobile phone and a laptop. Both of these are placed under a common GUID of 11011 and so on. And then the person sending to him, the service will check with the name certification service and can look up that GUID based as John Smith 22 and then send to that GUID this data and then the network will uh, forward this through the whole network on a hop by hop basis, keeping the file sort of intact or the fact we deal with large packets in this architecture. And uh, eventually, it will be routed to both network 99 and network 32. And all of this is done through a single packet with a single GUID. It doesn't require, even though you have two completely different devices on two different networks, the, the same message will reach both these devices. Okay, so this was one example. And to answer the question from two minutes Can ago. A question? Yes. So when is the binding done from GUIDs to network addresses? Yeah. So in this particular example, we showed an edge binding where uh, right at the first uh, edge router, the binding was completed and then these two network addresses were put into that. And uh, it, it is a matter of policy and you can put into the service ID a request that every router should be solved. But if you want to use the fast path, Subsequent routers will simply look at the network address and forward to 99 and 32 in this case. So there's only one binding as long as these two devices stay connected to 99 and 32. If one of them moves away from 32, for example, then NA32 will not be a valid uh, address, but that's fine because there will be a failure at in a 32 and then a rebinding will be done by the edge router that tried to deliver to to that device. And the rebinding comes up with a new location and immediately forward. So, uh, but you can, if you like, uh, do something of a more conscious late binding strategy. And these are optimizations really. So we have some ideas in which, for example, in a multicast environment where the group is changing rapidly, you don't need to commit to a binding in advance because that binding may anyway have a large number of network addresses. So if you say taxis in New Brunswick and somebody is sending that message from a faraway network, you might as well allow it to be rebound closer to the destination. So in those cases, we can put in an appropriate uh, policy which allows you to uh, to do that, you can also do things like UID tunnels where you send to a particular destination with network which then does the binding. Okay, so moving on to the question about how to realize the GNRS. So this is, of course, a very classic distributed systems problem, and we are not the first one to encounter that. I think this is coming up in various fields. And what we did was we recognized that routers uh, cannot individually store such a large table, but if you have, say, 1 million networks and 100 billion devices, 100 billion GUIDs, then uh, if you evenly divide these among the networks, then you, you have a pretty manageable amount, uh, less than 1 million entries per router. So. What we're doing now is we have this concept of a hash-based 
approach, a DHT approach, where I take this example from if a user wants to insert a GUID, what it does is it simply computes the set of network addresses and for simplicity we have shown IP addresses here. So it computes from the hash a set of network addresses and whatever it computed directly, it goes to those network addresses using the available routing tables, which are the lower level of this control plane. So the routing tables are already there. So unlike the conventional overlay DHT solutions, you don't need a separate routing table. You can leverage the network routing table itself. And then you go to 67, 10, 12, 1 and store that value over there. So we have implemented this type of directory structure. And uh, the results on the right hand side are uh, indicative of the kind of uh, delay latencies that you can expect for the lookup. So you notice that 100 millisecond level, which is halfway through this uh, x axis, uh, it gets you to about 95 percentile or 96 percentile delay um, if you're looking at k equal to 5. So there's some replication. It's a very simple replication scheme. And there are people who are now studying how to do locality-based caching or locality-based hierarchical hashing in order to further improve from, say, 100 down to 10 or 20 milliseconds uh, to be able to, to achieve uh, very high, late, very good latency requirements that might be associated with cyber physical systems. So, for general mobile users, 100 millisecond is thought to be sufficient and is well below what a cellular network has in terms of inter-network latency. Uh, so, we think these numbers are encouraging. Uh, we also have this one. The result shown here is based on a full-scale. Uh, internet simulation using the DIMES database, uh, but we also have a, a test bed running across approximately 200 nodes right now. And if we go scaling from 10 to 20 to 200 nodes, the results are quite good. But it's actually a difficult problem to to do a full experimental evaluation of a large system like this, and we have started to do some experiments on the Gini testbed, uh, but it's not completed yet. Okay, so uh, going on to the further studies that we've been doing on DNRS scalability, this just shows you an example of if you're talking about trace-driven mobility models, which are increasingly available, the statistics available from this one shows the Jersey City uh, traffic mod, uh, the mobility models and traffic generated by some 16,000 users. There is a much more comprehensive study, which is a Beijing uh, mobile phone database that uh, that has been produced, and quite a few papers use that data set. So, using these different data sets, we can come up with uh, calculations of how much workload is generated for this. Uh, for the GNRS, and uh, in this case, the number of updates per second you know, for this particular physical region is still, still quite reasonable and doesn't tax the limits of the system. Well. Of course, as new applications come up, there might be faster update rates on certain technologies. Okay, the uh, concept of storage aware routing is something that I mentioned before. Uh, again, this is something that we have been playing with for quite a few years before we decided to integrate it into this architecture. Here, the basic idea is to uh, to go from today's internet, which happens to be, uh, although it is a connectionless packet switch network, it has adopted many techniques from end-to-end, -end, uh, not I wouldn't say circuit switching, but there's end-to-end flow-based. Uh, connectivity is the norm in the internet. Here, what we try to do is break that into multiple segments, and at each segment, you have the option of storing. So, in this example, we show that if you have a wireless, two wireless paths, as shown over here, where you have a low cellular, a low cellular link bandwidth, and <laughs> this device might anyway migrate to a office or a home in the next half an hour you might as well not try to send a gigabyte file to it 
across this uh, low bandwidth link. So that kind of a decision can be made by a router. And we have a particular algorithm which you compare long-term path quality and short-term path quality. And if the long-term path quality is good, but the short-term path quality is not good, then you can make a decision to store. And the reverse is true that if the short-term is really good, well, the long-term is not so good, it means you should opportunistically forward as quickly as possible. So using these techniques, we have found significant gains in performance in different realistic Wi-Fi or uh, mixed Wi-Fi cellular types of environments. This particular uh, example is from some older work about two years ago where we show a gain of perhaps five to one uh, in some typical Wi-Fi headnet type of scenarios with both cellular and Wi-Fi. Uh, and that's not unexpected because there's so much fluctuation that some level of storage and making conscious decisions to store and schedule later is something that even information theoretically you can predict very large gains. Okay, so moving from that to a deeper look at the router itself. So if you look at this picture now, it shows what's coming in and going out of a router. So this router, is how it differs from an IP router in the sense that the bottom part of the router looks not very dissimilar to an IP router. You have a destination network address, which may not have the same uh, semantic structure as an IP address. We use flat network addresses, uh, but other than that, it's similar. And the uh, routing table looks like a, a series of network addresses with port numbers and next ops. Okay, so that part is similar to IP. But if you go to the upper part, there is a GUID based forwarding table, which is a virtual DHT table, which corresponds to the GNRS <coughs> that I had mentioned before. So the GNRS is this peer to peer global name resolution service where the router is supposed to have 10 billion entries or 100 billion entries in this virtual table. Of course, it will not have most of the entries in its own table. But whenever a GUID needs to be looked up, the router will initiate the peer-to-peer -peer process by which it fetches that value from any other, some other router in the internet. So in the case that you come in with a GUID and a set of NAs, this is in this particular example, you see that the router can use its forward fast path because the two blue NA 99 and 32 are currently available. And as the packet goes through, it strips off the NA99 and produces uh, two separate, it produces two separate packets, each of which has only one network address after it comes out of the router. So this is what I meant by sort of seamless handling of multicast and anycast and taking full advantage of the packet switching as a delay tolerant storage capable medium. You also have browser storage and you store when the path quality is not that good in the short term. And if the GNRS query itself fails, then you would have to store and then try to do a late binding. So that happens when due to mobility, the network address became invalid. So this is the functionality inside a router. And again, a few more sample results. So this shows what happens with storage routing as you go through a bunch of hotspots and we can see that the performance with storage routing is significantly better. These the MF ones are the ones with storage routing and corresponding ones are the TCP. So if you compare the TCP at 30 miles an hour with mobility first at 30 miles an hour, this is all done with fairly detailed NS3 simulations. Again, some of these we have experimental setups that can do the same thing, but fairly difficult to get reproducible performance data of this type. So we've been doing a mix of simulations and, uh, as well as uh, as experimental work. Okay, so this shows, again, typical improvements, and that's what I mentioned earlier, that when we talk about the mobile internet, it is tending toward the much more heterogeneous, partially connected infrastructure and we need protocols that can do well in these environments. Okay, so another example I'm giving here is how you would handle 
this connection. So this is again, if you followed the previous example, not very different. So here I'm sending a GUID it says to send a data file to John Smith 22's laptop. I put the SID equal to Unicast mobile delivery. The first access router will resolve this to NA99. Uh, the packet keeps getting forwarded, and then at some edge router in NA99, there's a delivery failure due to device mobility, and then the router will end up storing and periodically checking the DNRS binding. So this is what we call late binding. And this late binding capability gives you a lot of nice uh, features that you can use not only for mobile devices, but when you deal with cloud services or reconfigurable uh, in network services, this type of functionality can be quite helpful. Uh, so, in this case, if the device moves, eventually it shows up at NA75. The DNRS reports that value at the uh, when it is queried, and then eventually the packet gets delivered. So, this is a simple use of the protocol to handle this. Okay, so, this is again another. Uh, example of how it works. This is a more recent result uh, in which we found that you can get significant boost in throughput as you go through with TCP uh, versus these kind of protocols with a more complex environment where we had here a full LTE model as well as a set of access points uh, spread over some geographic areas. And then one more example to yeah, okay. Just to conclude, in these examples, the dual homing is another example. Uh, if, if you recall the previous one, same type of thing where you have dual homing means that you're going to have more than one network address being resolved. The packet goes through in unicast mode until it reaches somewhere close to the edge. At that point, if the router decides to bifurcate that. And then the two packets get bifurcated with one each one skipping one of the network addresses out. They become unicast packets and then get delivered uh, to each of the two networks. So nothing complicated here. It's fairly simple. Okay. So uh, I think I've given a number of these results, and uh, I hope I've been able to more or less explain the main operating mode of the protocol that we have. There are a lot of details in it, and I have actually in on our project website, we now have papers that describe almost all the major components. There's one piece that it has not yet been published much, and that is the inter-domain routing. If anybody is interested in that, we do have some results now. We are uh, working on something called edge-aware inter-domain routing where the idea is to do telescopic routing updates similar to OLSR or OSPF, but done at the internet scale, and put into that some visibility of the internals of the net of each network. So BGP doesn't do that. BGP has a very simple uh, path dissemination strategy. So instead of that, we disseminate topology rather than path. And uh, in doing that, we are able to construct a model for the whole internet at any given router and make a little more informed policy. So one interesting example is when you're multi-homing, you're, you may have two domains which deal with it. One is that AT&T has, has some autonomous system which is serving you, your cellular, and your office network is serving you Wi-Fi. So these two networks might actually diverge up at tier one or tier two. So it is not possible to go all the way to the edge and then decide what to do in terms of bifurcation. So you need a, a routing algorithm that supports this kind of efficient bifurcation and multicasting across interdomain. So that was not a requirement for BGP. So we have been studying that and as one of the components we are gradually putting that piece in, and there are also simpler routing routing protocols that we can use, and we can certainly use BGP-like protocol. If none of these features are necessary, we could at least start with something like BGP as a foundation. 
Okay, uh, so let me just pause before I go to the prototyping section. I think I've reached about five o'clock, and I'd like to also ask you uh, how much time do we have and any questions about the protocol? Um, I guess we can go on for uh, 10 minutes or so without any problem. So please do carry on. Uh, any questions, anyone? So I have a question about the scope of the DUIDs. Uh, how, how widely are they going to be distributed? So does uh, anybody in uh, India or China need to know about my cell phone? Uh, okay, I, I I'm not hearing your whole question. Can I can you repeat? Yeah, the question is how how what is the scope of the GUID distribution? Okay, so currently we are treating this as a global internet requirement. So anyone joining the global internet will have the a unique GUID. But what this also has in our design is that the GUIDs are a very large space. Uh, of, ad of addresses, so in you can anyone can generate a GUID. So if you talk about China versus US, if for example a country felt that it needs to to uh, have control over the GUID issued to Chinese devices, it can do that. You can have a local GUID generating uh, service, which we call the name certification service. Which then has some trust model and then generates GUIDs for hosts in China. Similarly, if Intel wanted to have its own uh, GUID naming service for its, all its machines, it can do that. So it allows for groups or individuals to create their own GUIDs. And the basic observation here is that the probability of any two GUIDs colliding is negligible it's less than 10 to the minus 12 and uh, we don't think there will be any collision but if there is a collision that gets detected by the GNRS and the GNRS will always do a consistency checking and then inform the overlapping GUIDs that there could be a problem but in you know there's virtually no chance of that happening so you can have many different authorities producing GUIDs. Can you argue if something like uh, you know if Skype had a billion users and FaceTime had a billion users and Google Hangouts had a billion users, uh, they are essentially issuing uh, approximately GUID and they themselves are resolving that, right? Yes, yes, exactly. No, so I think what we're seeing that's slightly different though. They're registering at the time of registering for the service, you make sure you get a unique ID. At that time, you do make so sure. That's, that's yeah. Like, yeah. Right. So we do have the DNRS, which is the common part does have the opportunity to verify their uniqueness and in fact if a router wishes to only deal with trusted GUIDs based on national laws or local policy whatever it can also try to enforce those kind of things. So now the router is also doing a lot of work at this point right so it's storing a lot of content it's managing UID space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the routers are more complex than uh, traditional IP routers. But if you go back, if you look at what Cisco offers you when you buy a Cisco router, it actually does a whole lot of this and more. It's just doing it with the proprietary framework. In some cases, Cisco has a framework by which you can store content as well. Uh, you can do caching in a router and so on. So I think those are. Uh, What's happening is the technology improvements have been enormous in the past 30 years, and yet routers remain extremely simple, and that's good uh, up to a point. But what we found is so we implemented a full fledged uh, mobility first router recently. We have, I'll show you a couple of examples of that in the prototyping part. And from what we can see, this is not stressing the limits of technology yet for say up to 10G speeds, if you're talking about 40G and higher, might need a little bit of work. But we do have some options for uh, fast path bypass and so on. So if, just like in IP, when you go into the deeper core of the network, you can use optical fast path switching and none of this really matters once you go up above a certain speed, 40G for example. So let me say a few words now about our prototyping activity. So all of this work was 
backed up by a, a background effort to build every component and then test it out on platforms such as Orbit, which we run at WinLab, and Genie, which is the national uh, wired network tester, wired and wireless <coughs> networking tester. So we have been building up this component to one important piece in the post protocol stack. And by the way, most of these are available as open source. We have not made a formal updated release. Very recently, we are hoping to do that by around the end of this year. Uh, but any group that some groups have taken this code and tried out their own experiments. So the devices that we're dealing with are Android phones and laptops right now. On the client side, we have a, a full protocol stack implementation which has, again, uh, the notion of a mobility first socket layer which has some of the primitives that I described before where you address by GUID and then you can do things like get GUID or <coughs> send to a GUID with different modes of communication, multi-pass, multi home multi and so on. So this is a piece of code that's running. And uh, we also have the software router, which was the first uh, implementation that we did, which leveraged the existing click router uh, software and then added to it the mobility first name resolution <coughs> routing. Uh, we also have a compute. We have a compute service layer, which I didn't talk much about. There's a group at Duke University who has been working with us, Xiao Wei Yan. So her group has come up with a in-network compute function that we can further add. So uh, in, this is the question of complexity. So we do feel that uh, even more complexity is, is in the card. So uh, we think that, for example, having a bit-by-bit Compute processing might like such as transcoding or from a, a high resolution format to a mobile video format is something you can put into the network and it results in a lot of efficiency gain. Uh, but right now we don't know how much of it we can put in and we sort of think of it as an in network cloud. So we are experimenting with that, but that is one of the additional features that we have. Uh, we also have the option of content caching in, in each router. <laughs> so this is the implementation and uh, we have had this running for a while now with the different protocols which I outlined. Uh, we also have an open flow or software defined network implementation of mobility first. This was useful for us, this was important for us because the Gini networking prototype that's available nationally has a lot of open flow devices. So we needed to make sure that our technology can be mapped onto these devices. And what's unique about open flow is that you have relatively dumb switches with API and there's a central controller that can be used to implement all these additional functions. So we, our work was aimed at uh, not just implementing IPv6, which is the most common thing, right? IPv6 plus some policy, and instead replace it with this UID uh, forwarding plane. And in doing it, we learned some interesting things. If anybody is interested in that, it's an ongoing project. Uh, we use the VLAN tag. We have right now the available open flow switches don't actually have a arbitrary field like a UID that we can match on. So because of this, uh, many of the packets would normally have to go up to the controller, but we deal with that by taking the first uh, chunk and sending it up to the controller, but subsequent chunks in that flow, uh, here flow means that the UID source their destination, uh, would then be able to do a fast path mapping, uh, which is done through uh, using a VLAN tag, which is then inserted in all the packets after that. So we have that running also, and uh, Kiran Nagarad, who is my colleague here, who is our lead for prototyping, he has uh, been writing a couple of papers, and if you're interested, please do contact him. Uh, we had an interesting experiment with Japan, uh, in which they have built a new software-defined platform called Flare, 
which has been open to API vertex also as FPGA based uh, hardware at the bottom to do fast, fast, fast processing for some of the compute intensive functions. So this turned out to be an interesting experiment to see that, for example, if we wanted to do per, per package GUID processing rate binding type of function, uh, how fast can you do it? So initially, at least the test we have done show that we should be able to achieve 10 gigabit per second using this platform. This itself is a very experimental early stage platform. Uh, but again, looking at these results, it gives us some confidence that the type of functionality we have in mind is not, is actually just in the trend of today's uh, IP technologies and network processor and open source type of technology. So using all these, we think we can uh, achieve pretty good performance, at least up to the 10G level. So we're not yet uh, ready to say what is needed for 40G, uh, but again, more processing in just a matter of time. Okay, this was demonstrated at EC16, that's the Guinea Engineering Conference in March 2015. Uh, okay, and then um, we also have some outdoor uh, wireless deployment. This one shows our WiMAX base station, which we are operating as a full-fledged experimental cellular network, and we have been doing quite a few dual homing, multi-homing type of experiments using this plus other Wi-Fi access points in the region. So uh, using this, we were able to also validate the uh, applicability of some of these kind of storage aware and hop-by-hop protocols to make sure that they work. Uh, finally, this mini multi-site deployment was something that we have running now. There's a notion of running a permanent network. Much as you know, again, from past history, it seems that if you can operate a network and run it for some time and then capture some new services that if you need your functionality, over time you may gradually attract a sufficient audience. So what we are hoping to do is to keep this operational and then invite different application uh, groups or people interested in clean slate deployment uh, to participate and join in. So we actually have three field trials planned for next year. One of them involves uh, a brand new fiber optic network and some uh, public broadcasting stations in Pennsylvania which are shipping content around, and we're quite interested to see this main content architecture and how they might be able to take advantage of that. So we are trying to do a service trial with them that also includes cloud computing. So again, cloud computing comes relatively easily in this architecture where every cloud service has a GUID and then the network any custom to whatever GUID that you have. So that concludes my talk today, and I'm putting up a few uh, links for for your information. The project website has perhaps 20 or 30 papers in there. A uh, number of presentations and other notes are also available, so uh, please do browse through that. Uh, the Gini and Orbit website also tell you how experiments are being run. And uh, at the forthcoming uh, GEC 18, I think it is, that uh, there is a Gini Engineering Conference in Brooklyn two weeks from today. So at that meeting, we are going to be demonstrating uh, tens of handsets which are moving around that place and using some of the multi home and content retrieval capabilities. We actually have a, a geographic context aware application that is running on that device. Uh, so that was actually what we did was we had a undergraduate uh, REU program last summer where about 20 undergraduates from various universities came to Rutgers and worked on mobile applications which might be run on mobility first and uh, we had a pretty good experience and the demo that we'll be showing was actually a joint demo that was done by undergraduates from CUNY and Rutgers and uh, has the uh, concept of leaving geographic messages in different locations and then the network picks those up and delivers it based on interest and location and so on. 
Uh, okay, so I think I've taken up a lot of your time and uh, I'd like to pause and answer any remaining questions.